Well, tonight I would like to honor an age-old tradition, and that is the concept of politicians inundating us with empty phrases and empty rhetoric. This last Tuesday night, George Bush had a press conference, and I never heard so many cliches, so many slogans, so many just empty words, empty statements that don't mean anything at all. And, of course, George Bush is not unique in this. Every president has been this way, said all kinds of crazy things and passed them off as profound wisdom. I found this press conference particularly interesting in that George Bush seemed to be on the defensive for the first time. Newspaper people and television people were actually asking him critical questions, making him justify things he had said about weapons of mass destruction and so on. And, of course, he was evasive. He was defensive. He was rambling. He was definitely unresponsive in not answering the questions that were asked of him. But afterward, Fox News had the Beltway Boys and a woman from the Washington Post on to critique his performance, and they all said he was masterful. And then this evening I saw on the Capitol Gang on CNN Robert Novak saying that it was really too bad that the questioners were trying to get him with gotcha questions instead of asking about particular facts or other things. Well, you don't ask the President of the United States about facts because he obviously doesn't know very much. If you want to know something, you do it at the daily press briefing with the press secretary. The time to ask President Bush, the only time, you can ask President Bush questions to justify his actions is at a press conference like this. If the newsmen and the television reporters didn't do that, who's going to do it? Who's going to actually pin George Bush down? Well, let's look at some of the things that he said. Quote, Iraq will either be a peaceful democratic country or it will again be a source of violence, a haven for terror, and a threat to America and to the world. Well, I don't remember Iraq being a threat to the United States at all, a threat to America. As a matter of fact, America was bombing Iraq almost every day for ten long years between the two Gulf Wars. And Saddam Hussein had no military might. Saddam Hussein had no weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein was not a threat to America at all. George Bush also said, Our nation honors the memory of those who have been killed, and we pray that their families will find God's comfort in the midst of their grief. As I have said to those who have lost loved ones, we will finish the work of the fallen. Now, that really is empty rhetoric. George Bush doesn't seem to realize that when you die, that's it. The world is over. There is nothing more. And there is nothing in the world worth dying for. You can't die for freedom because when you die, you don't have freedom anymore. You can't die for your country because when you die, you don't have a country anymore. And the people who have lost their loved ones cannot be comforted, cannot be told that we will finish, we will finish the work of the fallen because all that's saying is we're going to go out and get more Americans killed just so that your son will, or daughter will not have died in vain. And if there's anything ridiculous, that's it. And yet that's what we hear in war after war after war, that it would be a disservice to those who have died to quit now, to make an armistice, to stop. George Bush said, if additional forces are needed, I will send them. In other words, it doesn't matter what all this costs. It doesn't matter how many people have to die, how much of your resources have to be confiscated to do this. If additional forces are needed, George Bush will send them. And he goes on to say, if additional resources are needed, we will provide them. And he goes on to say the government will do all that is necessary to assure the success of their historic mission. Yeah, right. He also said, we are a liberating power, as nations in Europe and Asia can attest as well. Yeah. Tell that to the people of Haiti, where our government put Aristide in power and then five years later went in and removed Aristide. Tell the people of Iraq that after America liberated them by helping Hussein and giving him biological and chemical weapons in the 1980s. Tell the people of the Dominican Republic that they were liberated when the United States installed the Trujillo family and kept it in power for about 50 years. Tell the people of Iran, who saw their only democratic government overthrown in a U.S. coup in 1953. Tell the people of South Vietnam, who saw the United States liberate them by propping up in power the Diem family there and uh, a very brutal dictatorship. And you could go on and on and on with all the countries that the United States has liberated. Liberated means put in power people who pledge to support whatever policy the American president wants in exchange for money and the power to keep their oppressive reign going. And then, of course, George Bush talked about June 30th. On that day, the transitional administrative law, including a Bill of Rights that is unprecedented in the Arab world, will take effect. Well, right now, the Bill of Rights would be unprecedented in the United States, too. We don't have a Bill of Rights anymore. He then goes on to talk about the schedule already approved by the Governing Council. Iraq will hold elections for National Assembly no later than next January. That will draft a new permanent constitution, which will be presented to the Iraqi people in a national referendum held in October of next year. And then they'll elect a permanent government by December 15, 2005, an event that will mark the completion of Iraq's transition from dictatorship to freedom. Put a note on your calendar in Dece for December 2005, and get this transcript. Uh, you can link to it off my website, and mark that on your calendar, as I say, and just see how much of this comes to pass. What's really interesting is that he said, the nation of Iraq is moving towards self-rule. And then three paragraphs later, he said, we're working closely with the United Nations envoy and with Iraqis to determine the exact form of government that will receive sovereignty. 
Well, how can it be self-rule if the United States is going to decide what it is that the Iraqi people are going to have? But that's just more empty rhetoric. Iraq's neighbors also have responsibilities to make their region more stable. In other words, if Iran and Syria and Lebanon don't do what the United States says, look out. And then goes on to refer to the success of free government in Iraq as vital for many reasons. There isn't going to be a free Iraq, it's, or at least it's very, very doubtful that that's going to happen. And then he says a free Iraq will confirm to a watching world that America's word once given can be relied upon even in the toughest times. America didn't give its word. George Bush has been making statements. George Bush makes statements and then expects America to back it up and then says it's necessary for the credibility of America that the president's word be backed up, no matter how much it costs you, no matter how many people you know that may wind up over there and dead. Above all, the defeat of violence and terror in Iraq is vital to the defeat of violence and terror everywhere and vital, therefore, to the safety of the American people. There's nothing to support this statement that defeating Iraq is going to change violence and terror in the world. Another empty statement. Over the last several decades, he says, we've seen that any concession or retreat on our part will only embolden this enemy and invite more bloodshed. Well, if the United States has retreated from any place in the world other than Vietnam, I'd like to know about it. If the United States has shown weakness towards any country in the world, I'd like to know about it. They keep telling us that only through strength can you prevent war. Well, the United States' foreign policy has been one of absolute strength for the last 50 years, and those 50 years have been one war after another. It isn't just the Korean War and the Vietnam War and the two Gulf Wars and the invasion of Grenada and the invasion of Panama and the war in Afghanistan. It's also the overthrowing of the government in Iran. It's also moving into South America and fighting drug lords down there. It's also uh, marching through the Middle East. It's also getting involved in all kinds of skirmishes. It's also helping people in Indonesia to kill the East Timorians, and on and on and on and on. America's strength has not created peace. America's strength has created turmoil throughout the world. He also says the terrorists have lost the shelter of the Taliban and the training camps in Afghanistan. They've lost safe havens in Pakistan, and they lost an ally in Baghdad. There's never been any proof that Saddam Hussein was allied with the terrorists that America is supposed to be at war with. He also says we serve the cause of liberty, and that is always and everywhere a cause worth serving. Yes, liberty. Why don't you go get on an airplane, a commercial airplane, George Bush, and see how much liberty there is in the airports of the United States these days. A very, very interesting uh, part of it is that we were told before the war that the Iraqi oil revenue would pay for most of the reconstruction. And a questioner brought that up in the press conference, and Bush said, well, the oil revenues are, they're bigger than we thought they would be at this point in time. I mean, one year after the liberation of Iraq, the revenues of the oil stream is pretty darn significant. He always uses such good grammar. And so why is it we're paying $87 billion? Why is it that altogether this is going to cost at least $200 billion for the American people if the oil revenues are there and are bigger than was expected? He said, the United Nations passed a Security Council resolution unanimously that said disarm or face serious consequences, and he refused to disarm. Mr. Bush, have you not figured out yet that he didn't have anything to disarm, that there are no weapons there, no illegal weapons, no weapons that were banned by the United Nations? Haven't you been paying attention for the last year, and you're still saying that he refused to disarm? What was he supposed to do, run down to the 7-Eleven store and buy some weapons of mass destruction so that he'd have something to show the United Nations inspectors? Bush says he had long-range missiles that were undeclared to the United Nations. Do you know what those long-range missiles were? He was allowed by the resolutions of the United Nations to have missiles that would travel 80 miles. They found some missiles that would travel 85 miles. And the reason they would go the extra five miles is because the payload had not been added to the weight of the missiles yet, which would slow them down and keep them to 80 miles. These are the long-range missiles that George Bush says were a danger to the United States of America. And then, of course, Bush has to say, this is a guy who was a torturer, a killer, a maimer. There's mass graves. He's going to mention those mass graves for the rest of his life. And yet nobody ever says who's in those mass graves, why there are mass graves. Are these mass graves of people that Saddam Hussein killed willy-nilly and there were so many of them they had to pile them into one big pit? Or are these people who died in the Iraq-Iran war? Or are they people who died in the Gulf War, Iraqis? As a matter of fact, at the end of the war, some of the soldiers said that they used bulldozers and just simply piled Iraqi soldiers into pits and covered them up. So it's maybe that the mass graves that George Bush keeps talking about are ones that were created by the United States. He, referring to the terrorists, says we must do everything in our power to find these killers and bring them to justice. Mr. Bush, justice means a trial. Justice means a search for the truth. Justice does not mean bombing people, shooting missiles at them, or dropping bombs. It does not mean killing people. It means finding out whether or not they did what you think that they did. And, of course, over and over he has to say, quote, Saddam Hussein was a threat, and the world is better off without Saddam Hussein. I don't think anybody can. Maybe people can argue that. So I don't know whether Bush is saying that people can or can't argue with it, but I sure as heck would argue with it. I don't think we are any better off as a result of this. I think there are probably more terrorist possibilities in the world now than there would have been if America had just kept its nose out of Iraq. Bush says, I also know that there's an historic opportunity here to change the world. 
Did we elect this man president to change the world? I don't think so. And he himself said in the election campaign that he does not believe in nation building. At another point, he says, as the ultimate decision maker for this country, I expect information and so forth and so on and so on. Well, if he's the ultimate decision maker for this country, I don't know how we can say that America is now a safer place. Another place, he says, it dawned on me that had we blown the peace in World War II, that perhaps this conversation would not have been taking place. America did blow the peace in World War II. We have been at war for 50 years since then. At another point in the press conference, in answer to a question, <clears throat> excuse me, he said, the legacy that our troops are going to leave behind is a legacy of lasting importance as far as I'm concerned. Well, that's true. We're all here to create a legacy for George Bush. And he said, of course, as he has many times, free societies are peaceful societies. Well, that clinches it for me. Obviously, we're not a free society because we certainly are not a peaceful society. The worst statement of all, and I will skip ahead to it now since we're running out of time on this one, as the greatest power on the face of the earth, we have an obligation to help the spread of freedom. We have an obligation to help feed the hungry. I think the American people find it interesting that we're providing food for the North Korea people who starve. We have an obligation to lead the fight on AIDS and on Africa, and we have an obligation to work for a more freer world. That's our obligation. That's what we've been called on to do as far as I'm concerned. Think about what that means to your life. And let's just finish this up so we can get on to other things. Several times in the press conference, George Bush referred to America as a free society. We believe in freedom. The cause of liberty is important to us. We want to take the freedom that God has given us and give it to the rest of the world, and we are a free society. And on and on and on, he refers to us always as a free society. And then in the next breath, he says that you must spend a few hours every week working to provide resources to fight AIDS in Africa, to feed the people of North Korea. And your children, your sons and daughters, must go over to the Middle East and fight to bring democracy to the Middle East. And he goes on and on and on with all these obligations. We have an obligation to work toward a more free world. That's our obligation. That's what we've been called upon to do. We have an obligation to feed the hungry. We have an obligation to help the spread of freedom. Well, how in the world are we living in a free country if the President of the United States can tell us all the things that we have to do with our lives? That's not freedom. That's not liberty. And yet that's what George Bush thinks of as freedom and liberty because it's the freedom that he has to impose his way upon us, to impose a $2.4 trillion government upon us, the freedom to be able to keep people locked up in Guantanamo prison uh, for as long as he wants to keep them there without access to their families, to an attorney, to a trial, to confront their accusers, to do anything that is guaranteed under the Bill of Rights. That's what freedom means to George Bush. And one last point, he says, the war on terror is not going to end immediately. This is a war against people who have no guilt in killing innocent people. Well, there's two things I'd like to say about that. Number one, as far as killing innocent people is concerned, I have never seen him offer any kind of apology, any kind of regret, any kind of remorse, any kind of sympathy for the thousands and thousands of Iraqi civilians who have died and for the thousands of civilians in Afghanistan who died as a result of United States bombs, missiles, firing by guns, by tanks, by any kind of means whatsoever. All he talks about is the killing of innocent Americans, and that's very, very important that Americans are being killed. That's why we have to change our foreign policy so America can be a safe country again. But as far as he's concerned, the people over there are just cannon fodder. But the other thing that he said, the war on terror is not going to end immediately. He continually talks about the fact that we're winning the war on terror. How can we be winning the war if it's never going to end? And he's almost assured us that that war is going to last for our lifetime. So we're obviously not winning it at all. We are just waging it, and it is the most undefinable, uh, amorphous kind of war that you can imagine. There is no victory in it. There is no point where they will say, the enemy has surrendered. It is all over. This war is meant to go on for the rest of our lives. This war is meant to keep us in captivity for the rest of our lives. This war is meant to assure that America will not be a free society. Well, I'm going to calm down now and talk to somebody who I trust is much calmer than I am, and his name is J.P., and he is in Tallahassee, Florida, and I want to say good evening, J.P. What's on your mind tonight? Good evening, Harry, and uh, I don't know if I'm a little calmer, just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, Bill Clinton was a snake, but at least he could put a sentence together in one breath. You know, this guy is just painful to watch. Oh, I know. And I had some, on this uh, transcript of the press conference, I had some terribly tortured paragraphs marked, but I'm just taking too much time with this, and so I skipped okay. over those. <laughs> well, I think, I think the scariest sentence that he said... I I think he just missed it. It was right after the sentence that he said before the break, and that was, he said, and my job as the president is to lead this nation into making the world a better place. Oh, I know. I don't know what constitution he swore to uh, uphold and protect, but I don't remember our constitution saying anything that that was his job as president to do. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, a couple of that with as great as power on the face of the earth, we have an obligation to help the spread of freedom. He says we have an obligation to help the spread of freedom, and he, he has to lead the nation in making the world a better place. Spread of freedom and world a better place, I think he has different definitions for what that means other than what I do. I think of it as a peaceful term. I think he means spread of freedom at the point of a gun. Oh, of course. And if, he sa if he's really correct that as the strongest power in the world, we have this obligation to spread freedom throughout the world, then obviously the first thing we should do is to become a less strong power so that we no longer have that obligation and we can go back to living our own lives, which is, I thought, the object of creating a free country in the first place. Right. 
uh, a lot of times they ask, you know, they try to compare uh, if, if this war is uh, going to be compared to the Vietnam War. And, you know, they always, uh, they always say, no, it's nothing like it. I mean, this is, this is not good. What's interesting, though, is that I was reading that it, while it, for the first six years that the U.S. was involved in Vietnam, the total fatalities didn't surpass 500. Um, and already we're, we're not even a year into this war, and uh, we're, we're almost at 700 deaths. Yes, so, people always compare the end of something else with the beginning of what's going on now and say, well, there's no comparison whatsoever. You're right, at the very beginning in Vietnam, that all started in the early 60s, long before thousands and thousands of troops were going over there to be killed in the Vietnam jungles. Right, exactly. Um, and just on a completely separate subject before I let you go, I, I, just, I found something that I thought was hilarious that, uh, that is actually on uh, the, the government's website. If you go to... Uh, uh, www.nclb.gov, which is the No Child Left Behind website, um, and you go to nclb.gov, and then on the left-hand side, there's a little place, a little place where you can click on that says Overview, and then under that, you get an option that says Why NCLB is Important. You can click on the article if it says Why No Child Left Behind uh, is Important to America. Well, right at the beginning of that article is a graph that shows federal federal spending on education uh, compared to the how fourth graders read proficiently. And this graph just shows you how year after year federal spending on education has just skyrocketed. We're talking about now it's reached, it started in 1966, we were talking about $4 billion, and right now it's over $22 billion that we're spending on education. And right on the same graph, there's a line that shows fourth grade reading scores uh, on the same graph that's remained stagnant. And there's a little note that says just 32% of fourth graders read proficiently. So right here on, on a, the federal government's website touting this program, they're, they're showing the failure of, of government spending on education. And what's their solution with, with No Child Left Behind? Spend more money. Do more of what we've been doing to put us in this terrible position. Yeah, you're, you're right. I've, is there any explanation on the page as to why they have that graph there, which is uh, obviously it's, damaging to their case? It's the first thing right here. This is the Elementary and Secondary Education Act first passed Congress in 65. The federal government has spent more than $321 billion oh. to help, help educate disadvantaged children. Yet nearly 40 years later, only 32% of fourth graders can read skillfully at grade level. Sadly, most of the 68% who can't read well are minority children and those who live in poverty. So, and this so, is, so they haven't been doing it right up to now, but we're going to do it right in the future. Right, exactly. And this, what's funny is, is that they're, they're, they're saying that it's a failure, and, uh, and yet, they, uh, and yet they, they just put it on their website. It's almost like as if Microsoft said, look, our old operating systems are crap, you know, on the Microsoft page, but sure. the new XP user operating system is way better. And right, and we're going to double the price. Problem. Right, they're just slamming their own policies on their website and just saying, and, and it's just full of graphs, this page, on how bad it is. So percentage of 12th grade graders proficient in science, and it's a downward graph. Percentage of 4th graders proficient in reading, stagnant graph. Uh, so it, it's unbelievable to me that they just have this, this damning evidence on their own website. I'll uh, take a look at it at the break, and I'll put a link to it on the Radio Links page. Thanks Thank so much you. for calling, JP. I appreciate Thank you, Harry. it. Always a pleasure. Let's go now to Norfolk and talk to Joe in Norfolk, Virginia. Good evening, Joe. Good evening, Harry. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. What's up? Uh, I think uh, Bill, not Bill, uh, George Bush. <laughs> George Clinton. <laughs> George Clinton. Um, yeah, that's another guy, too. He's, he's a trip. Um, George Bush's uh, news conference uh, this past week would have been an affront to, and excuse me for saying this, but an affront to the, the dumbest dirt farmer, the most illiterate person 200 years ago who understood why this nation was founded. Um, today, I think a lot of what he said just went by a lot of people because it's the same kind of blather that you hear from everybody else. But if you can boil it down to one thing, and this is the one, one, one thing that made me a libertarian, I think. It motivated me more than anything. And it was a question that I ran, asked many years ago. And she said, um, there is, not questions, a statement. She said, there is no such thing as an unchosen obligation in a free society. All those things that George Bush said about we have an obligation to do, he is putting on to other people because he's president of the United States. Right, and we haven't chosen them for ourselves, so how can they be obligations in a free society? He uh, has no, the, the point being, uh, Harry, is that he has no idea what a free society is. You know, of he course went on not. at length at, uh, of what a free society is and what it should be and what it should be in Iraq, and he, he doesn't have a clue. Right, no, absolutely right. And as a result of that, we have no assurance whatsoever that we aren't going to be fighting in Syria next year or, or Lebanon the year after or Libya or North Korea or China or Russia or as, as <laughs> Turkmenistan or someplace around the world because this man is an open-ended obligation giver. And next year we'll have an obligation to do something else. And the year after that we'll have an obligation to do something else. And all he has to do is go tell the world that we're going to see to it that a certain country does something, and then we're on the hook to make good on his credibility. If we don't follow up by going in and killing a bunch of people, then the president has been disgraced in the eyes of the world because the country did not back him up. Well, the best thing in the world that could happen would be if the country didn't back him up, well, if the country really did act free. You're, you're, you're right. Here's, I think, a difficult thing for a lot of people, libertarians especially, is that uh, – I myself cannot root for my country. I, I simply cannot. Uh, I cannot find anything good in Americans going to Iraq and killing soldiers 
or innocent civilians. I do not believe, you know, Milton Friedman said about the Chrysler bailout in 1980, the worst thing that could happen is if it worked. Right, you and, know? and then it would set a precedent for one after another. And you're, you're right about that. And last year when the war started and some people who had opposed the war said, well, now that we're uh, in the war, we support our troops, we support the government, we hope that the, we there's a quick victory, this, that, and the other thing. Why? What good is that going to do? How is that going to make America freer? And especially, how is it going to make it more peaceful when it seems apparent that all America has to do is go over and, and start fighting somebody and it'll win a quick victory? And that doesn't mean that I'm pulling for the other side. It doesn't mean that I want to see Americans sure. killed. Uh, I just want America out of these things. There's no reason to be in them. And I have to make this point to anybody listening to this show for the first time. This is not a campaign message for John Kerry. If John Kerry is elected president, do not expect things to change in any significant way whatsoever. Just as they didn't change from Clinton to Bush, just as they didn't change from the previous Bush to Clinton, just as they didn't change from Reagan to Bush, and so on, back all the way to Franklin Roosevelt, this is a terrible time for our country because all we have are so-called leaders who believe that leading means taking this country into one war after another. And that is not what America was meant to be. And the best thing you can do in November is to vote Libertarian or not vote at all. Joe, thanks for your call. Thank you, Harry. Let's continue now with that or some other subject brought up by Ed in New Orleans, Louisiana. Good evening, Ed. Good evening. You know, politicians love wars because not only do they get plenty of graft concerning the military, which is secret and above criticism and during the war, of course, but because it tends to obscure all the crookedness that's going on in domestic matters. You know, the news media is sure. supposedly preoccupied with the war. By the way, you know, presidents would keep saying, we have to keep our word. word. If you look at the history of the world, you find that, that, that political leaders have gone back on the most sacred treaties at the drop of a hat, whatever it's suited their convenience. So, I mean, it's, it's got to be a joke throughout history, the notion that if we don't keep our word, people are going to like us. You know? Oh, yeah, and the, word is, and the word is broken over and over and over again as you're, as you're making the point. Uh, the, the, matter, uh, the truth of the matter is that the United States, like all other countries, makes treaties and then says this treaty will last for thousands of years, and next year they're breaking it and doing something different. There's no question about that. And uh, what you said about covering a multitude of sins domestically, one example of that is that this $2.4 trillion budget of George Bush's is justified as being necessary because of the war on terrorism and the war on Iraq and so forth. Well, as a matter of fact, fact, most of the increased spending is on the domestic side, but as long as this war is going on, it can just be written off as well. Oh, no, it's necessary because of the war. I want to point out a pork barrel project that's opening tomorrow on the, the, April 18th. It's a restoration of the Canal Streetcar Line, which cost federal taxpayers $161 million. The line, by the way, was ripped up in 1964. And I want to point out something that shows how hypocritical our so-called news media is. The Times Nicky Hume, which supports George Bush, by the way, completely, has been uh, sniveling and whining about what a wonderful thing this pork barrel project will be for our city, how we will revitalize Canal Street, uh, hardy har har. But they were also talking about what a terrible thing it was that the original line was ripped up in 64 and what an awful thing and blah, blah, blah. When the facts were that back in 1964, the chief proponent for removing the Canal Street car line was the Times Picayune. They conducted a campaign over a year, articles and editorials and columns with the theme, Get rid of it! And here, you know, here they are talking, oh, let's put it back, and how terrible was they removed it? Sure. It's just, but it's graft. I mean, as long as something brings in graft, Ashton Phelps is up with the publishers, uptown buddies, you know, they don't care what. You know, what it does. Sure, and you make the point that they're saying that this is going to revitalize downtown and so forth. Well, what's overlooked always with taking taxpayer money for a sports stadium or spending a lot of taxpayer money to bring the Democratic convention to town or the Republican convention to town or something else is that the people who have to make this investment are not the same people who are going to profit from it. And if a company makes an investment, then... The, and, and it actually does have some returns, the people, the shareholders who actually made that investment are the ones who will profit from it. But when government does it, it takes the money from some people and gives it to another. If it's going to increase uh, business downtown at the restaurants and so forth, it's going to be at the expense of the suburban restaurants or some other area that would have gotten the money and, and the business instead. But politicians just love to tell you how some investment in whether it's a streetcar or a convention center or a stadium or whatever it may be is going to be good for the city, when all it is is, of course, taking money from one group of people and giving it to another group of people. Well, these are the so-called revival projects never work anyway. No, of course. Uh, you know, it's interesting. In Seattle, they are now paying for two stadiums because they did a bond issue for the Kingdome back in the 70s, and then after in the 90s, they decided the Kingdome wasn't good enough. It still wasn't paid off yet, but they went ahead and demolished it and built another stadium, and now the people of Seattle are paying for two stadiums. And of course, how many people can go to a football game in one week in a city of millions of people? Ed, good point. Thank you so much for calling. And so let's talk with Percy. Good evening. How you do? Glad to hear from you. What's up tonight? Sure. I want to ask you a couple of questions. I was listening to some of the things you were saying earlier, and I disagree with a lot of it, but I want to ask you a question. When do you believe it was when the United States ceased to have the president with the libertarian values you report you want to return to? Well, I would say that every president has violated the Constitution in some way. 
And there are simply no exceptions, not even Thomas Jefferson or Grover Cleveland or George Washington, who were some of the best. But for the first hundred years of this country's existence, the violations were few and far between, except for during the Civil War, when Abraham Lincoln, in effect, suspended the Bill of Rights and put people in jail for disagreeing with the government and closed down newspapers and even shut down some state legislatures. But other than that period of Lincoln, uh, we had a pretty sound country. You know, it's, it's interesting that the taxation that the colonists objected to was absolutely minuscule compared to the taxation that we put up with today. And throughout the 19th century, the taxation was pretty minuscule also. At the beginning of the 20th century, taxes at all levels of the government, federal, state, and local, amounted to only about 8% of the national income. Today, that's 47% of the national income goes to taxes of one sort or another at one governmental level or another. So obviously, there's a great difference. And I don't expect ever to live in a totally free country, at least not in my lifetime, maybe in yours or maybe in your children's lifetime lifetime, but certainly not in my lifetime, but I would at least like to be able to get back to the Constitution. I would at least like to be able to get back to that 8% or 10% level. Uh, certainly, what we have today is not a free country. Okay, well, let me, let me follow that up. Uh, what, uh, uh, why did not the uh, Congress and courts frame uh, those presidents saying, like you say, uh, Lincoln, and uh, well, uh, or at least after Lincoln, and return the nation to where you believe it should have been? Well, after each war, the nation does retrench a bit, but it never goes back to the situation that existed before the war. The taxation level stays higher, the size of government stays higher, and so forth. And as far as the Congress uh, creating a check on the president, the, the Constitution was set up to have these uh, checks and balances between the branches of government, but the president cooperates with the Congress. Look at what we have today as an extreme example of it, and that is the Congress passes all kinds of ridiculous boondoggles for the uh, favored members of various congressional districts around the country, and George Bush just signs these bills. George Bush should be vetoing these bills and saying, no, there's no constitutional authority for this. And when George Bush tries to go to war without a congressional declaration of war, Congress should say, no, there's no constitutional authority for this, and impeach the president for getting America into a war. And uh, all of these things have just fallen down because they cooperate with each other. The Congress people uh, depend upon Bush for their favors, and Bush depends upon Congress to back him up in his adventures. And so we have lost all of that. And of course, we have Supreme Court justices who don't believe the Constitution means what it says when it says Congress shall pass no law, they say, well, Congress shall not pass a law unless such and such and such and such, unless we think that during wartime it's all right, or unless uh, we think that this is too obscene, or unless we think this doesn't apply to commercial speech, or whatever it is, and all sorts of violations on free speech and freedom of the press and freedom of assembly uh, are imposed upon the American people, and of course all the other uh, uh, articles in the Bill of Rights have uh, long since been trashed by the government, and the different branches cooperate with each other. I'm sorry, uh, that's a, a rather lengthy answer right. to a short question. But do you do you do you um, do you uh, um, hold um, the uh, um, hold that against the press or the educational system that uh, uh, the things uh, Congress, the courts, and the presidency is the way it is? I think you've touched on a very important point. I think one of the worst mistakes that was ever made in America was turning the education of our children over to government. Uh, that didn't start until the middle of the 19th century, and it didn't really become ubiquitous throughout the country until late in the 19th century. Uh, before that, children were educated. Children uh, were able to read. Poor children found a way to learn how to read and to learn how to do math and so forth. Uh, but there are many reasons that government got a foothold in the education system. Part of it was a fear by some Protestants that Catholic schools were teaching children how to be good Romanists and you know all of the Catholic conspiracy talk and so forth, so that it was necessary to pass uh, laws to make public schools so-called government schools and then make it mandatory that children go to those schools. And, of course, you can't expect government employees to teach children why it is important to limit government, why it is that government should never have the power to be able to reward one person at the expense of another. And so by uh, letting our children get all of this information from government employees, they grow up having no concept of what America was meant to be, a country in which government was limited to a few specific functions so that it would never have the kind of power that it has today. But, of course, it does have that power, and it is, I think, largely due to uh, the government school system. And, of course, probably the worst mistake that was made politically in this country was passing the income tax amendment in 1913, because without that unlimited sense of, of revenue that the government could have, you wouldn't be able to do many, many of the things that the government does today. For one thing, I'm quite sure that the U.S. would never have gotten into World War I if it hadn't been for the income tax amendment, because they just simply could not have financed the war. The British and French were already bankrupt at the time the United States entered the war, and the United States took over all of the costs for the war, and it could never have done so on the limited revenues that came in from tariffs and excise taxes. So you don't, you don't fault the press at all for any of this? Well, 
I think that the press are just people like us, and they grew up in government schools, and they grew up learning that there are problems in society that the marketplace can't take care of and that we need to call on government for this, that government to saved us from the Great Depression, that government has kept the peace in the world, that government, without government, we would all be preyed upon by criminals. Oh, that's right, we are preyed upon by criminals, I forgot. If it weren't for government, uh, we would be at war all the time. Well, we are at war all the time, but you know what I'm saying, is that right. they grow up with the same kinds of mythology that the rest of the, the population grows up with, and so I don't believe that the press is either democratic or Republican. I don't believe it's either conservative or libertarian. I believe that the bias in the press is toward more government. Well, Leslie, let me close with this. Um, seeing how you believe that probably since Lincoln, um, uh, things probably started changing uh, when he suspended uh, the Constitution and all parts of it. Um, how many registered libertarians do you believe there are in the United States, and how many office holders do you believe there are? I can tell you about the office holders. It's, I think it's in the range of six or seven hundred now. And if I'm wrong about that, it's as low as four hundred or as high as a thousand. But it's in that it's in that range. As far as registered libertarians, I can't really tell you, but it's probably in the neighborhood of a hundred or two hundred thousand who are registered libertarians. And if if the point you're trying to make is that there aren't a lot of them, then yes, that's that's certainly true. But there's no point in there being a lot of them because it just simply doesn't do any good. There are ballot access laws in this country that mean that if you raise a lot of money to run for office as a libertarian, the first big portion of that money is going to have to go into getting on the ballot, something that the Republicans and Democrats don't have to deal with, because in many states the laws are set up whereby if you're a Democrat or Republican, you get 100 signatures and pay $100. If you're a third-party candidate, you get 10,000 signatures and maybe pay a fee of 1000 or even $10,000 to get on the ballot. When I ran for president in the year 2000, we raised $2.5 million, and unfortunately, 10% of that 10% of the, t of the money that we raised didn't go into advertising, didn't go into salaries, didn't go into travel. It went on, on, into getting on the ballot in just two states of the country. Pennsylvania and Arizona consumed a quarter of a million dollars just getting on the ballot. And we didn't even get on the ballot in Arizona. So I was only on the ballot in 49 states. But the point is that it is an exercise in futility with the laws stacked the way they are. Big, big pardon, what were you saying? No, I was going to say, it sounds as though uh, uh, all your efforts are futile. Um, it's almost as though your party is nothing more than a bitch and moan session, basically. Well, it is important that there be a party that presents alternatives and points out that it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to have the health care problems that we have in this country now. We didn't have these problems in the 1950s because health insurance was available to everyone. Uh, uh, doctors and hospitals did not take an arm and a leg for their services. Doctors made house calls, and uh, health insurance was not so terribly expensive as it is now because there weren't all the mandates the government had put on it. It was in the 1960s when the federal government got into health care that all these problems started to develop and there needs to be somebody making this point we were talking with Percy in New Orleans about a lot of things he asked a lot of questions and he made the point that libertarians because of the legal problems that keep a third party from making any traction in America that the libertarian party then is nothing more than a bitch and moan uh, organization and to a certain extent that's true but I think that that is uh, influenced a little, that impression, by the fact that we've been so negative tonight. I've been trashing George Bush and the things that he said at his press conference, actually trashing him in the, uh, as a representative of all presidents who talk about the glories of war and the wonderful things that our military can do to bring peace to the world by killing people. And so it has been rather negative. But if we were to talk about the benefits of repealing the income tax, the benefits of ending the drug war, the benefits of getting the federal government completely out of health care, the benefits of getting the federal government completely out of education, and even better, getting all governments out of education, we would be on the very, very positive side. And if we have a lull here tonight without any phone callers that I would not want to keep waiting on the phone or disappoint, then maybe we'll get into a little of that. And maybe in the near future, next week perhaps, we'll have a completely positive show. So stay tuned. Joe sends an email saying Grover Cleveland was the last good president. Well, I would certainly agree to the extent of, of saying that since before Abraham Lincoln, the only three decent presidents that I know of were Grover Cleveland, Warren Harding, and Calvin Coolidge. None of them perfect, but so much better than the presidents that we have had in our lifetime. And, you know, Warren Harding is known as a man, uh, an administration of scandals, the Teapot Dome scandal and so forth. All of the Harding scandals put together are small potatoes compared to the money that Richard Cheney is making today off of his Halliburton connections and the contracts that Halliburton is getting off of the American military, probably thanks to Richard Cheney. So what we think of as terrible scandals in the Harding administration were really nothing. And Harding fired the people when he found out that they were wrong. Harry Truman, on the other hand, when he found out that there were people in his administration that were getting rich off the administration, he defended them, stood by them, and said, I will not turn my back on my friends. And, of course, he is applauded for his loyalty to his friends. And he has 
fast becoming one of the great presidents in the historian's list, along with FDR, Abraham Lincoln, and the other war presidents. Enough of that. Islay's been waiting on the phone patiently. He's in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, and so let's say hello. Good evening, Islay. Hi, Harry. I've been, uh, I've been following you for quite a while now. I saw you debate Howard Phillips and John Hagelin back in 2000, and I really enjoyed those debates. Um, my question is, <clears throat> um, why do you think that the media supports big government? And what I'm asking is, I completely agree with you on that, but uh, what is the reason behind well, I think that it's just a natural inclination that people get growing up in government schools. When I graduated from high school in 1950, I definitely was an individualist. Uh, I had uh, broken with many, many of the cliches that I would hear in the classroom about how we must all be unselfish and we must all uh, put others first in our lives and so forth, and I could see through a lot of that. But still, when I came out of high school in 1950, I just naturally assumed that government was there to solve problems, that government was there to take care of us, that government uh, was there to do good things for the economy and for society, and that we should vote for the people who who, uh, who are going to do the most to make things right in society. Well, being the kind of person I am, uh, it didn't take very long after I got out of that environment of school to begin to shake all of that off. But I don't think a lot of people do that. I think most people are not as just naturally individualistic as I am, and so they don't put those things to the test when they get out into the fresh air of freedom away from the government schools. And th this is where the reporters and the journalists come from. And so they, like the rest of the population, just assume this. Now, if they were to spend a day really thinking about this, thinking, do I really believe that we should take from some people at the point of a gun and give it to other people? No, I don't think I, we should. Do I really think that Teddy Kennedy is capable of running the health care system in America? No, I don't think he is. Do I really want George Bush making all the decisions in my life? Uh, no, I don't think I do. But that point of making that kind of introspection never takes place. And so as a result, most people just go on throughout their entire lives thinking, well, government is there to help us, and the press is no different. And so when there's a question over health care, then it must be something government must take care of. We're talking with Islay, and Islay, you asked why... I thought that the press is pro-government. Do you have some ideas on that subject? I do. Um, I believe the press is pro-government uh, because of, well, I've, I've read some of the works of G. Ed Griffin, and um, I kind of agree with him that there is a conspiracy for global government, basically. Uh, who, who is in this conspiracy? Uh, basically, it would be the, um, the international bankers who were the ones who started it with uh, um, the Federal Reserve Act and, and those types of things, trying to control the different countries. Uh, in this manner. Well, you know, I'm well aware that there were bankers behind the development of the Federal Reserve Act, but there's a lot of misinformation that passes for facts regarding the Federal Reserve Act, such as the uh, Federal Reserve System, such as that it's a private corporation masquerading as a government agency, when in fact it's just the opposite. It's a government agency masquerading as a private corporation, and it was set up that way in order to circumvent the Constitution, which at that time was much more respected, and the Constitution did not permit having a national bank like they have in England, like they had at the time in England, France, and the Netherlands, and so forth. But, but the point I really want to make is the fact that bankers wanted the Federal Reserve System is no different from farmers wanting a farm program, no different from the uh, leaders of the National Education Association wanting a Department of Education that will dispense all kind of extra money to the government schools around the country and so on. So we should not be surprised that bankers are big proponents of all sorts of things that benefit banks, because when you have a government that's big enough to take from some people and give to others, then everybody wants to be on the taking side, nobody wants to be on the giving side. But, but don't you think it's interesting, Harry, that, uh, that we fund both sides of a lot of wars? Uh, uh, I, find, I, I find it frightening is, yeah. is probably a better way exactly. of describing yeah. it. It is frightening, absolutely. Right, but I don't know that that has that much to do with the bankers. That just ha that's just the inevitable thing of uh, the inevitable result of turning something over to the government because government always winds up doing things in, in a way that we would think is ridiculous if it were done by somebody voluntarily in the free market. But it is true that government does sometimes uh, finance both sides of the war. It was doing it in the Vietnam War. It was giving money to Czechoslovakia, which in turn was giving money to North Vietnam at the same time that American troops were in South Vietnam fighting the North Vietnamese. And of course, it has done the same kind of thing on a staggered basis by giving money to Saddam Hussein and then a few years later going in and fighting Saddam Hussein, and it has done that with a number of countries around the world. And so it, it, government is just an irrational enterprise, and that's not, not a mysterious thing. It is an irrational enterprise because no one suffers personal consequences for doing things within the government. If somebody gets 100 people killed in the government, then that person who was responsible for that is not fined, he is not reprimanded, he is not uh, fired, he does not go to jail. But, of course, if a businessman does something that might cause some harm to one or two employees, he's subject at least to overwhelming lawsuits and possibly to federal prosecution that might send him away to prison for 10 or 20 
20 years. Okay. So, the, so my point being that since there are no consequences to the people within government, they are doing all sorts of things that people would never dream of doing outside of government, and one thing leads to another, and the next thing you know, you have these ridiculous situations. One of the greatest movies, actually it's the novel that's better, is the novel Catch-22. You start out at the beginning of the book, and everything seems to make sense, but everything follows one step from another, and by the end of the book, the U.S. Air Force in Italy is bombing its own airfield, and it makes complete sense, because it's gotten there step by step from the simple beginnings at the beginning of the book. It's a book about World War II and flyers in Italy it, by Joseph Heller, and it's a wonderful book. The movie was quite good, too, but the book uh, made the point a lot better, but I'm getting off the subject. Uh, let's get back to where you were. Right. Catch-22 is the name? Yeah, Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. Joseph. It's, a, it's a very funny book, okay. but it's a very pointed book also. All right, now let me ask you this, Harry, another question, uh, pointing to this conspiracy, because I've been kind of following this uh, for a little while. But um, let's see, do you think that the U.S. Uh, is in danger of losing its sovereignty to the U.N.? Not much, really not much. No president of the United States is going to turn his authority over to the United Nations. So while Bush keeps talking about Hussein violating U.N. resolutions, the United States violates U.N. resolutions all the time because Bush or Clinton or any other president is not going to uh, subordinate the United States and especially the president's power to the Security Council or the General Assembly. I think it's possible in some other countries that that might happen, but not to the United States because the United States politicians have too much to gain from holding on to that power. Mm. Okay. Um... I feel, uh, I, if, uh, uh, pardon me, I just have to make a point of this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you, okay. but it just slays me that for 50 years I have been hearing conservatives saying, oh, my God, world government is coming and it's going to be terrible and we have to fight against it and we have to stop it and so forth and so on. Right. Well, we have world government today, and the, and the capital of that world government is Washington, D.C., and the president of the United States is the king of the world telling everybody what they must do and telling everybody that you're either for us or, or against us, and if you're against us, then you are vulnerable to having your country bombed and so forth. We have world government, and I don't hear a single conservative Harry, complaining Harry, about it. I'm definitely a conservative that agrees with you on that, but... Um what I was going to say was actually I consider myself more libertarian, but I do follow these uh, these world government types of things. Um, what was I thinking of? Um, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting. I don't, <laughs> know how, I don't know how you're keeping a train of thought at all. <laughs> um, let me think. Where was I? Okay. Yes, I, I am definitely I definitely agree with you that we are acting like the kings of the world. We're being the police of the world. We're in this country and that country, and we should absolutely be out of these other countries' affairs. I agree with you 100 percent on that. But what I'm afraid of is that they are going to take away our rights as far as uh, property. And, and, you know, our monetary rights, eventually, it seems like that's the way that we're moving. Oh, by and they, who do you mean? The by they, I mean, I mean big government, whether it's the United States or the United Nations, either way. You know? Well, the United, the United States government is already doing it, yeah. and as, as I said earlier, I don't see much likelihood in the near future that the United Nations or any other world organization is going to do that. I mean, the United States has been running the International Monetary Fund. It's been running uh, many of the U.N. agencies. It's been the leader in the U.N. forces in the Congo, in uh, the Korean War, in any place where the U.N. has fought, and it's the same with NATO. Uh, it was the U U.S. that was fighting Serbia over Bosnia and fighting Serbia over Kosovo, even though it was done in the name of NATO. It's always the U.S. that decides this. It's always the U.S. that bears the cost. It's always the U.S. that is uh, at the front of the pack uh, chasing these people and so on. So I don't see any possibility in the near future that the United States is going to be suborned into some kind of world organization. Okay. Okay. Um, let me see. I had another question. Okay. What, what do you think is the best strategy, though, for us to, to, um, to try to avoid uh, getting more of our rights taken away? What do you think is our best strategy? Well, I think it's important for people like you and me and other people listening to the show, who, uh, those of the ones listening to the show who agree with us, uh, to speak out wherever you can do so without sacrificing your own life, your job, or anything else, but to speak out, to write letters to the editor, to call into talk shows, to point out things that aren't being pointed out. And if, you, if it will help you, go to my website, harrybrown.org. There's an index there sorted by topic. If there's a discussion on, the, on a radio show about the environment, go take a look at my articles on, envir on the environment, and you might see some points there that aren't being raised in the show, and then bring them, uh, call into the show and bring them up and keep pointing these things out and you never know who's listening somebody who may have much more influence than you do somebody with much greater resources than you have who can do even more than you can do and you might just tip him over the edge to, to start taking a stand and it is important to also that we be true to ourselves that we do not support people we don't agree with meaning we don't vote for the lesser of two evils Absolutely. and we don't uh, encourage big government by voting for big government people but for the people that are making government bigger and I think that these are the important first steps now there is no magic bullet there's nothing that I can say that if we just do A, B, and C, we're going to win this. I don't know that we're going to win it at all, but I also know that 
everything that we do is going to have some benefit. It's going to help some people understand this better. And as that happens, maybe somewhere down the line, some of these people are going to be able to do something that we can't do. And the result might be that at the very least, we slow down this growth of big government. Even better, we might be able to turn it around and make some dent in big government. And of course, wonder of wonders, we might even reduce government someday to its constitutional functions. And then we can talk about going whether or not we want to continue uh, cutting government from there. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for calling us, Leigh. I appreciate it. All right, Harry. And let's go now to Phoenix and talk with Les. Good evening, Les. Hey, Harry. What's up? Real quick. Um, first of all, it's not a conspiracy. There's no conspiracy out here at all. What it is, it's a network of people. These are business people that have common interests. You know, years ago they used runners and carrier pigeons and they invented things like clipper ships. And, you know, now they just use faxes and modems and computers and satellites. And it just everything just moves faster. They, they all have a common business interest and they're just all looking out for their own little world. It's all, you know, we're all our own little personal lobby. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Yeah, and it, it's, it's all in the, we, we know all about it. There's nothing secret about it. It's just that, hey, look, this is big business. This is the way it is. And, you know, you and I aren't going to change it this week. The only thing is, I, and, and I, I don't even want to be part of it, quite frankly. Well, but, there's a certain fascination with the idea of secret conspiracy. And yeah, yeah, and, and like I say, that that was that uh, definition was basically given to me by a friend of mine here in Phoenix, another talk show host, who asked if there was a conspiracy. She says, oh, heavens no. And she explained it that way. And, you know, I, I followed her and I said, you know, I, I'm going to steal that from you and use it because <laughs> it, it, it made perfect sense to me. And, and, you know, I've read all these books and all this stuff. And, and who cares? So what? Big deal. It's well, like, it, it wasn't stealing because you <laughs> took it from her in order to give it to me. <laughs> yeah, right. right <laughs> and yeah. so in the, in the uh, tradition of good government, you right, were just right. doing good. But I, I just wanted to bring up one thing. I think I called you last week or the week before uh, where my... This may, I guess, is at this particular point is about Congress has, has uh, abrogated their power. Article 1, Section 8 clause says, specifically says that Congress shall have the power to declare war. Sure. And I've thought about this quite a bit now, and, and my anger towards the, or, or confusion, whatever you want to call it, my emotions towards the president has really diminished su- substantially because tomorrow, uh, the Speaker of the House, Dennis Hastert, can call the House into order and either declare war or cut off all the funding. And they will do neither. And they will do neither. Right. Uh, so, Ron so, Paul uh, introduced right. a, a bill to declare war on Iraq just to make Congress take a stand, even though he was intending to vote against it. And Bob, and Bob Barr introduced one September 12, uh, 2001, and I think he had seven other people go along with him. He said, look, we, we know we got a problem here. Let's declare war. We'll fill in the blanks later, but at least let's do our duty. Right. Yeah, Harry, one thing I wanted to say, after the, the declaration of war that Ron Paul introduced, the, the chairman said uh, that declaring war is anachronistic. It just isn't done anymore. And then he said, you know, the chair went on to say that the Constitution has been overtaken by events by time. It's no longer relevant to a modern society. And and, but, but we're a free society, remember? Yeah, right. The ranking minority member called the declaration were frivolous and mischievous. The point I'm getting at is I watched a little bit, as much as I could stand, of our, our wonderful people uh, talking about the rule of law in Iraq. Uh, and on, yeah, on, on, right. You know, right, and they've been arrested with this arrest. You know, when our Congress failed to issue a declaration where we did not follow the, own, the rules that they set up, that they agreed to support. So therefore, to my estimation, and I'd like to be corrected if I'm wrong, and I'm trying to figure out a way to get this to the people out here, is we've abrogated our moral authority because we don't even follow our own rules. We don't even follow our own laws. So how in the world can we go, no matter how just or right the cause may be, if we don't follow ours, what we have is we have the fruit from a poison tree. You're absolutely right, and, and there's and, no, no way in the world that we can tell other people how to live when we can't even live by our and, own rules. And here's my thinking, and I use this as an example. I say if they go and vote 218 to 217 and 50 and Vice President Cheney casts a vote and the President signs it into law, you know, my opposition to most of this actually goes away for the simple reason that at least we followed our law. Now, mm. I've opposed it up until that point, and I've, I've protested it you know, in front of churches and carrying signs and so on, but the point I'm getting at is I may not like the outcome of it, but that's the way it was supposed to be. And yeah, I, I understand. I, I don't think that I would stop protesting it after they had passed it legally, but... Uh, yeah, I, I understand that, but you know uh, what I'm saying. I, I sure, of course I do, and I, I can't argue with you on that at all. Okay, thanks, Harry. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Let me wind up with a few emails here. Uh, Gene in Akron, Ohio says, we should not have gone into Iraq, but since then some of my friends have claimed that the reason Libya is renouncing its nuclear program and in Iran is inviting inspectors in is because Iraq showed them that we are serious and that they were intimidated to do it. I'm not sure how to, re- how to respond to them. Agree, disagree. What is a good response to my friends? Well, first of all, contrary to what George Bush says, Iraq invited the inspectors in. That's no different from what's happening now in Iran. But because America did not want to stop bombing, and I'm not entirely sure why throughout the 90s, they would not accept anything that Iraq did as a justification to stop the bombing and to stop the sanctions that were helping to starve a lot of people in Iraq. And as far as Libya having now conformed and done all of this, that's just what's happening right now. A year from now, we may be at war with Libya. Uh, Politicians are always making promises. Politicians are always telling you that uh, how wonderful a program is that it succeeded, and it may not even be starting until tomorrow, but they act as though the mere fact of having voted for something or having uh, passed some program means that whatever it was the program was supposed to do has already been done, and it, it never is. Jonathan in Washington says, I recently came across a press release from the office of Senator Zell Miller. And he says, quote, it's obvious to me that this country is rapidly dividing itself into two camps, the wimps and the warriors, end of quote. And Jonathan says, I guess it shouldn't surprise me when a senator flat out says that anti-war Americans are wimps, but it still does. It's so strange that a high-ranking politician would think it's a good idea to say something so ignorant and childish in an official press release. Amen, Jonathan. 
a banner out in Elk Mills, Maryland, says, any ideas or suggestions how to get third parties into the televised so-called debates? Well, if I had any ideas on that, I would have implemented them in 96 and 2000. We did everything we could. We did not succeed in getting into the debates. And I had hoped in 2000 to at least get a third-party debate with Ralph Nader and Pat Buchanan. And Buchanan went along with it, but Nader wouldn't. Dave in North Carolina says, is the convention for the Libertarian Party going to be broadcast on the Internet? I don't know. That's possible. I have no idea. But it probably will be broadcast on C-SPAN, and you'll be able to watch it. And Dave also says, the question I ask over and over again is, how do we know when the war on terrorism is over? No one seems to have an answer, so it seems we shouldn't be fighting a war with no end. And that's very, very true. But because it's a war with no end, because it's open-ended, then the politicians can use it for anything they want. And if you really want to understand this, then read the novel 1984 by George Orwell. You will be amazed at how many things in that novel are going on today in America. This is Harry Brown. Thanks so much for tuning in. I look forward to talking with you again next week. Have a wonderful week. Good night. Good night.